U.S. Navy History, arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I'm Dale, and the XO is Steven. Hey, Steven. Hey there, everyone. I I'm sorry that, you know, you had to spend the last week in the break, but you shouldn't have done that. I mean, it's my home away from home at this point. I, I think I spend more time in the brig than my own cabin. We we could just put your name plate up on the brig and, you know, give your cabin to the steward or somebody. Can I take my computer down to the brig now? If we do that? Hmm? Huh? When huh? you're not on active punishment. I'll accept that compromise. It saves me a trip uh, up and down several decks. We'll have to just unplug your computer when you're actually being punished. I can live with this. Okay. Welcome to your new home, the brig. So cozy. So today we're going to get into the Eastern Theater of Operations during the American Civil War. How do you feel about that? Well, uh, I'm feeling pretty good about it, actually. Let's get underway. I'm sure we have more than just uh, some ironclads, you know, slap fighting each other. Okay. I was not expecting that, but I'll take it. That's a win for me. <laughs> the Eastern Theater has campaigns in it that are pretty much mostly the famous ones in the history of the war. If, you know, not just for their strategic significance, but for how close they were to, you know, large cities, large population centers, all the major newspapers that are in those large cities. And, you know, of course, the capitals of everybody that was involved. Well, and also it was almost like a, a round of celebrity death match. Because those were all the household names at the time. You know, Lee, Sherman. Well, some of those household names did get booted west at yeah. times. But, you know. So, but yeah, you're right. Like, the, what you're talking about is that the imaginations of people getting captured right right like them, them getting caught up in the uh romanticization of the war like because a lot of them like to think of themselves as you know gentlemen soldiers like the people were getting caught up in the narrative yeah because of robert e lee because of the union army of the potomac and the bloodiest battle of the war in gettysburg and the single bloodiest day in antium and, of course, both Washington, D.C. and Richmond, both the capitals of the United States and the Confederacy, were, you know, besieged in the East. So the theater was, the theater boundaries was pretty much the Appalachian Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean. And the majority of all the battles that were fought pretty much occurred around and within 100 miles between Washington and Richmond. Just how far away were those two? I, I know not very far. About 108 miles via, you know, modern-day I-95. You have to wonder what they were thinking. Like, hey, we're going to, you know, give the giant middle finger to the Union and uh, completely rebel. Let's put our capital within a stone's throw of it. Well, I mean, most times. People don't think things through. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, something I can relate to on a personal level. Me too. <laughs> so the, the terrain between the two cities actually favored the Confederate defenders because of a number of rivers that ran east to west, making them obstacles instead of, you know, approaches that the Union can use. Right. It also made communication lines not very feasible. And, of course, because of the primitive road systems of the era, this limited campaigning for both sides in the winter. Because, you know, kind of hard to travel when your roads are crap. Yeah, yeah. You know, back in the 19th century, it was kind of like uh, living in the Midwest. You have two seasons, war season and winter. Yep. Yeah. Now, the Union did have an advantage. It was that they had control of the sea and the major rivers, which would allow 
them to stay close to the ocean to be reinforced and resupplied. So after the fall of Fort Sumter in April 61, both sides of the Union and the Confederacy, you know, they started scrambling to raise forces, raise armies. And as we said in the past episode, Abraham Lincoln, he wanted 75,000 volunteers to squish the rebellion as quickly as possible, which, you know, immediately causes the succession of four other states. Now, during this time, the U.S. only had around 16,000 men in their army. Yep, I think we covered that a few episodes ago. Yeah, with more than half of them in the West because of, you know, the Indians problem, as they called it, which, you know, was kind of crap because they were stealing land, forcing right. them to move and just... All right. Well, and, and until the previous half year, like the idea of the South, you know, being an enemy of the United States probably hadn't even crossed folks' minds in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the Army was commanded at this time by Lieutenant General Wilford Winfield Scott. He was, of course, a veteran of the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War, which means this guy is old AF. And on the Confederate side, the they were pretty much having to get the guys that were like, we believe in you, so we're going to quit the U.S. Army and we're going to form the Confederate Confederate Army. So some of the first fights occurred in West Virginia. The region had closer ties to Pennsylvania and Ohio than Eastern Virginia. Well, and West Virginia still wasn't a state at this time, right? West Virginia didn't officially split till the Civil War. Right, and that's because they were closer in ties to Pennsylvania and Ohio than they were the rest of Virginia. And, of course, they organized a pro-Union government, and they asked Lincoln for military protection. So, Major General George B. McClennan, who was the commanding officer of the Department of Ohio, ordered troops to march and attack the Confederates. There was a skirmish called the Battle of Philippi, and this was the first land battle of the Civil War. Really? I thought it was Bull Run. Or was that the first one of note? This was the first major battle. Bull Run was the first major battle. This was a skirmish. Oh, okay. So, so Bull Run was the first, hey, hey, meet us here. It's going down. We're doing this thing. This was just, oh, oh, whoa, 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 you're here? Crap. Uh, guys, load. Yeah, we'll go with that. Okay. Yeah, sounds good to me. So as the campaign continued through a series of, you know, small battles, Robert E. Lee, who had a excellent reputation as a former U.S. Army colonel, he gave a lackluster performance that pretty much gave him the nickname Granny Lee. Huh. The guy actually had no combat command experience. Seriously? Yeah. I never knew that. Yes. So he was then transferred to the Carolinas to start building fortifications. So the first significant battle of the war was in eastern Virginia on June 10th. And this is when the Union Major General Benjamin Butler would sent a few columns of men from Hampton and Newport News against the advanced Confederate outposts at Big Bethel near Fort Monroe. And this was won by the Confederacy. So this is where we're going to get into the first bull run. There the, we go. Yes. So this is in early summer, and the commander of the Union forces around Washington is... Do you know who? You're so excited about bull run. Well, I want to say... McClellan wasn't the first guy to be in charge. Um, no. Off the top of my head, I don't know. Brigadier General Irvin McDowell. That is a name I feel like I've heard before. You should. I don't know why. Because Bull Run, history. 
Yeah, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, he is actually an inexperienced officer in combat. Hearing he a lot of was... inexperienced officers here. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that too. He was in command of volunteer soldiers with even less experience than he does. Oh, goodness. A lot, yeah, a lot of them only have been enlisted for 90 days. Oh, so none of the original 16K. These are all the fresh part of the 75 that heard Lincoln's call for volunteers and like, oh, hey, that, you know, three hots and a cot? And I get to go travel? <laughs> this sounds great. Yeah, and at this time, their enlistments were about to expire because remember, Lincoln only wanted them at first for three months. So McDowell is pressured by, you know, all the politicians and all the major newspapers to, you know, take, quote, immediate action and telling him to go on to Richmond. So he came up with a plan. He was going to march 35,000 men and attack the 20,000 Confederates that were under a guy named Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard at Manzis. There was a second Confederate force of around 12,000 men in the Shenandoah Valley under a General Joseph E. Johnston. And he was supposed to be held right where he was by Major General Robert Patterson with 18,000 men of his. Hmm. They wanted to prevent the two Confederate armies from, you know, combining against McDowell. So on July 21st, McDowell's army, they start doing a pretty complex turning maneuver against Beauregard's army, which begins the first battle of Bull Run. Oh, okay. So I'm not familiar with military maneuvering. Um, it's a turn. Isn't that just, hey guys, the column's going southeast. Let's change that direction to southwest. Okay, okay, sounds good. You also have to keep in mind of the amount of people, the equipment, and everything that has to go on. It is not easy to take a group of 35,000 men and get them somewhere. Well, marching bands make it look very easy. They can even do fun designs when they do it. Yeah, but marching bands aren't 35,000 strong. <laughs> uh, God, where the fuck was I? I broke the captain. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Uh, so the Union, they enjoyed a advantage early on in the battle, and they drive back the Confederates' left flank. But that afternoon... Things started turning around. General Thomas J. Jackson, he takes his Virginia Brigade, and they withstand a strong Union attack, which gives him the famous nickname of his, Stonewall Jackson. Also, reinforcements start arriving by railroad from Johnston's army. Because Patterson, yeah, he did a really bad job of keeping them you know, occupied. How bad is bad? Well, the Union soldiers start to fall back. And then it turns into a rout. Oh, okay. So this wasn't a fall back. This was a full-blown, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't, nobody said they'd have guns. I'm going home. A lot of them didn't stop running until they reached Washington, D.C. <laughs> I mean, guys, uh, this is, Terrible. Poor show for the U.S., but at the same time, that's hilarious. Yeah. Now, uh, back in this time, you know, on the hills surrounding the battlefield, there's usually, you know, people watching. Civilians and political observers. Mm. They ran for the hills, too. Yes, what started out as a, oh my, lovey, what a large group of strapping lads. Uh, Tabby, which color are we rooting for again, blue or gray? It doesn't matter. Turned into, lovey, lovey, they have cannons! Grab the carriage. So the army does return safely to Washington, and Beauregard was so inexperienced, he failed to launch a pursuit of the retreating army. Oh. And, you know, all his guys were, like, exhausted anyway. 
So there's I mean, no way for him to motivate them either. Yay. That's good. On the other hand, yeah, that's that's a big blunder. Yeah. So the defeat at Bull Run shocks the North. And, you know, this makes a sense of grim determination sweep across the U.S. Because the civilians and military realize that, well, this is going to be expensive. This is going to be bloody. And this is going to be long. This won't be that splendid little war and have everybody home by Christmas. Yeah. So, George B. McLennan, who I mentioned earlier, he was brought east in August to command the new army that was forming called the Army of the Potomac. And this would actually become the main army in the Eastern Theater. He was a former railroad executive. So, because of that, he actually possessed very, very good organizational skills that were actually very good at administration and training for his men. And he was also very, very ambitious because you have to be to be a railroad tycoon. Yeah, yeah. And so he had maneuvered around Winfield Scott by November 1st and was named general in chief of all the Union armies. You know, even though he had a embarrassing defeat when he sent people up the uh, Potomac River at the Battle of Ball's Bluff. I'm sorry, what was that battle called? The Battle of Ball's Bluff. Huh, you said bluff. Yeah, I did. Now, if uh, memory serves, McClellan was arguably the most inept, you know, commander of the U.S. Army in the entire war. Yeah, he was named General-in-Chief of all the Union armies. No, no, I, I just, if memory serves across the entire war, he was, like, the worst, like, never doing anything. Oh, no. No? I don't believe so. Could have sworn McClellan was the one that was just, like, you know, you need to attack. I, mm, I don't know about that one, Chief. You literally outnumber them. They could have more hiding in the hills. I'll get you more men. What if they get more men? So just a brief history of him. From what I'm seeing, he was a Democratic presidential nominee in 1864. He served as the governor of New Jersey. He organized the Army of the Potomac. And, oh, he only briefly served as the general-in-chief of the Union Army. He like I said, played an important role in training and organizing the army. But his meticulousness in planning and preparations hampered his ability to challenge aggressive opponents in a, you know, fast-moving battlefield environment. He chronically overestimated the strength of enemy units and was reluctant to apply principles of mass frequently leaving large portions of his army unengaged at decisive points. So yes, he was a crap general, but a good administrator. Oh, yeah. No, well, I mean, if you're a railroad tycoon, obviously you know how to, you know, balance a checkbook and make sure stuff gets to where it needs to get, but that doesn't easily translate to uh, people trying to kill one another. Oh, there we go. We learned something. Yes, just because you're good at Railroad Tycoon does not automatically mean that you'll be good at being a four-star general. Mm-hmm. We got the Battle of Sewell's Point. This was a little battle with two gunboats versus a battery. So, <laughs> yeah, this was part of the, the Union blockade of Chesapeake Bay. The Union gunboat, the USS Monticello, who was captained by Henry Eagle. Yeah. And his XO was Lieutenant Daniel L. Brain. They exchanged gunfire with the Confederate batteries on Sewell's in Virginia. They were trying to enforce the blockade of Hampton Roads in southeastern Virginia. The fire that was exchanged by the ships and the battery were pretty much nothing. They really didn't do any damage to each other. 
So even though these weren't ironclads, it was still a naval slap fight. Yeah, it was a slap fight. Uh, they The Monticello starts firing on a unfinished Confederate battery, which was on the entrance to the Elizabeth River and the harbor at Norfolk. But they had no guns yet. So the Confederacy, they start moving in guns when this starts happening. And by 5 p.m. the next day, the Confederates have installed three 32-pound guns in the battery. That's a lot of gun. So the Monticello starts firing on them again a half hour later. And the battery returns fire. And then the Monticello leaves. The shooting will continue until the shooting stops? No. They were like, oh, they're firing back now. Let's get out of here. <laughs> now, the Confederate forces didn't have a Confederate flag. So instead, they raised the Georgia state flag over the battery. Okay, I need to remind myself what the Georgia state flag is. Okay, so the state flag of Georgia at this time, field of blue, with, uh, honestly, it looks like a police badge in the center. I mean... Yeah, I guess you could say that is, I, I would describe that more as, you know, like, uh, like the front of a courthouse building, kind of, with the pillars. Oh, well, that's in the badge. Oh, is it in the badge? At least the one I was looking at. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, they put that up instead. So the Monticello then returns uh, a couple days later. They fire two shots at the battery and run away. <laughs> boom boom battery turns fire and they go away <laughs> not much happened let's see so also during the early eastern theater there was the battle of aquia creek this was between union navy gunboats and uh, another confederate shore battery in stafford county virginia this was from May 29th to June 1st, 1861. Hmm. So on the 29th, a converted 250-ton paddle wheel steamer that had three guns called the USS Thomas Reborn of the Federal Potomac Flotilla. This was commanded by Commander James H. Ward. He attacked the Confederate batteries at the Aquila, but that didn't really do much. The Confederate captain named Lynch reported that the Thomas Freeborn fired 14 shots and only wounded one man in his hand. Did they just not know how to hit a ship? No, oh, this was at the battery. Oh. This was the ship firing at the battery. Only wounded one guy in the hand. I assume the guy was trying to shake hands with the cannonball. And failed. Hmm. That or a uh, high five for keep. Yeah, maybe. So the next day, the Thomas Freeborn comes back, this time bringing with them the USS Anacosta, which was a 200-ton vessel with two guns, and also the USS Resolute, which was about 100 tons they engage, all three of these guys engage the Confederate batteries for a long time, for a few hours. Wow. Yeah, they didn't do much. So they come back again on the 1st, and this time they bring a fourth boat, the Sloop of War, the USS Pawnee. And they bombard the batteries for five hours, firing 500 rounds. Now, the Confederate captain, Lynch, of the battery, reports that there were no deaths or injuries from the second and third days of shelling. There were two deaths that he re did report. That was from a chicken and a horse. Not the chicken and the horse. Yeah, but no human injuries or deaths. He did say that some of his defense works were damaged. There were... Houses that were in the back that were, quote, knocked about, and that the railroad line going through there was torn up in three or four places. Lynch also says that he returned fire sparingly because he wanted to save ammunition. 
and because that you know he could only fire when the ships were in view and in range. Hmm. Okay. Because you know, because his guns couldn't be turned very well. It was kind of hard to maneuver them. Once they're in place, yeah. they're in place. But the Thomas Freeborn and the Pawnee, they take minor damage during these battles, and they needed to be repaired. And there were no serious wounds on the boats. Nobody killed. So this was pretty much just a pew, 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 pew. I make noise. You make noise. This was uh, two stormtroopers trying to do a shootout. Pretty much. Then there was the Battle of Pig Point. This was between a gunboat and a shore battery. Was it over a smoked ham? Possibly. This was the USRC Harriet Lane, which was a Union gunboat and a shore battery with a rifle company on June 5th, 1861 at Pig Point in Portsmouth, Virginia. This is at the mouth of the Nansmond River near Hampton's Road. So General Butler, he orders his this guy named Captain John Fonts to take the Harry Lane to attack the Confederate battery at Pig Point to try to see what the strength of that battery was. So Fonts follows his orders and attacks the battery. But there's a problem. What's that? There's shallow water. Oh no. Yes. The death of uh, ships that like to be at sea. So this means that he had to fire from a distance that was pretty much too far. So most of his fire, you know, falls short of the position that they were firing upon. Now the Confederate defenders, they return fire, which includes the rifle company, and wound five of the steamer's crew. So Fonts, he makes the determination that, well, the battery is strong. So, hey, we completed our mission. We found out that they're strong. <laughs> so he withdraws the Harriet Lane. Now, Robert Pangram, he is the commander of the Confederate battery. And he reports that the Harriet Lane fires 33 shots and afflicts no casualties or damage, that they return to fire with 23 shots. Now, there is a account later that the Harriet Lane had actually disabled a 48-pound cannon in the battery, but we don't know which one actually happened. It's one of those situations of they say they did, but there was nobody not on the ship to verify the report. And it's not like the CSA is going to say, nope, yep, nope, good job, they got it. Mm -hmm. You sons of bitches got it. Now, we do know that five crew members on the Harriet Lane was wounded. Did they also try to high-five cannonballs? Let's say yes. Okay. Guys, cannon battles are not meant to be played like handball. Okay? Just let this be a public service announcement. All right, so now we have the Battle of Mathis Point. This was between the Union gunboats, USS Thomas Freeborn, the USS Reliant, a landing party of about 36 Union sailors slash Marines, mm -hmm. and the Confederate Army defenders at the Mathis Point on the Potomac River in King George County, Virginia. Hmm. So in June of 1861, Commander James H. Ward, he is the commander of the Union Potomac Flotilla. He learns that the Confederacy were installing batteries on a wooded area at Mathis Point in King George County that would pretty much control all the traffic on the Potomac River at that point. This would prevent men and supplies from moving to and from Washington, D.C. via the Potomac River. I'm noticing a bit of a pattern here. So were the Confederates, after they realized, well, the Union has a clear advantage in sea power, and we can't possibly, you know, fill that gap. So we're just going to make land-based defenses. So 
you know what, they can have their blockade, we hate it, but they have it, but they aren't getting in. Not from the sea, at least. Yeah. Because while they're trying to build up a navy, the easiest and quickest way to defend are these fortifications. Yeah. Solid plan. So the Potomac River would actually help the communication between the Confederate forces and Confederate sympathizers in Maryland and possibly even permit Confederate raids into Maryland. So Ward's like, yeah, we got to stop this crap. Yeah, but we, we need to put a stop to that now. Preferably yeah. five minutes ago. So he takes his flagship, the USS Thomas Freeborn, along with the USS Reliance and a company of Marines and sailors under Lieutenant James C. Chaplin to attack this new Confederate position. And they were also going to remove trees from the location so that they cannot hide a battery on the point and then install their own battery. So the Thomas Freeborn arrives around 1000. And according to them, other sources place them there more at 1300. But the crew begins their bombardment. This is, you know, the classic. We're going to soften up the location and, you know, provide cover for our landing party. Makes sense. It's a tried and true method. Yeah. So the Union fighters, they immediately engage with the Confederate fighters and drive the Confederate fighters back. They, and then the landing party starts establishing artillery positions. They brought the artillery with them on the boats, but they hadn't dragged them to shore yet because they had no place to put them. Then four to 500 Confederate reinforcements arrive and start firing on the Union force. Now, Ward, interestingly enough, he had actually accompanied the landing party at first. But once he saw those 500 guys coming, he's like, nope, I need to get back on the boat. I need to get those guns firing at them again. So that's what he does. He goes back to the boat and orders the guns to fire on the counterattack. The fire from the Thomas Freeborn actually does beat back the counterattack. And they attempt to land again because, you know, you see 500 guys coming for you. You're going to retreat a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's a good sign to, you know, maybe back off a few steps. Yeah. So they land again and they start putting up sandbag breastworks and the Thomas Reborn, you know, stops firing so they can see what they're doing. So they complete the construction of the small breastwork that they were putting up and they started to try to camouflage it so they can hide exactly where it is from the, uh, from the enemy. Okay. And then they start to withdraw to the, sh back to the shore around about around 1700 to grab their artillery and to bring them up to that position. And that's when the counterattack started again. They just cannot catch a break. Yeah. This time, Chaplin and their men just withdrew completely back to the boats. So, Chaplin and one other man were the last to withdraw. Chaplin actually personally saved this guy's life. Because this guy was not able to swim, which was actually pretty standard back in this day. Yep. And the boats had actually already shoved off. So Chaplin throws him over his shoulder and carries him out to the closest boat. And when you say carries, you're meaning swimming, right? Yeah. That, uh, wow, that is uh, actually pretty impressive. It is not easy to, you know, swim effectively, especially in open, deep water, I'd imagine. Uh, but yeah, with a second person weighing you down, there's a reason why lifeguards have to go through a fair amount of training. Yeah. Or at least they're supposed to. They're supposed to. So meanwhile, on the Thomas Freeborn, a gunner was wounded. So the commander, Ward, he takes the gun sight over to sight the gun. And he's actually shot in the abdomen by a rifle shot. And unfortunately, he dies about 45 minutes after this. And pretty much after he's wounded, the rest of his crew is like, um, okay, we're done. Captain's down. We're, no. 
stow the guns. We're got we're done. Yep. If the CEO's out, we're out. Unfortunately, though, Chaplin's still in the boats in the water trying to get back to the boat. So now they are not covered at all. Oof. Now, Ward is the only man killed in action during this battle. And four others were wounded. And Ward is also the first Union Navy officer killed during the Civil War. We got one more battle of the early Eastern War. Or the... We have one more battle of the East early eastern theater of war and that is the battle of cockpit point this is these battle names man you like that i mean the last one one of them had bluff this one has point it, well these were just a bunch of immature jerks weren't they yes they were so there's not much to go into with this after the victory at the first battle of bull run the confederate army they make a defensive line from you know pretty much centerville which is along the Occoquan river to the potomac river and they use the potomac's okay. banks as gun positions to halt the union traffic which is what we've been going over this entire last what 30 minutes and you know they wanted to isolate washington so the confederacy they construct batteries at evans port which which is now downtown Quantico, and it consisted of two batteries on the river bank and another one 400 yards inland. There was a CSA field battery located at the mouth of the Chapawasay Creek, where it empties into the Potomac, and okay. there was one on Shipping Point. There, uh, there was also one on Freestone Point. And on Cockpit Point, which is your favorite point, there were the batteries, there were powder magazines, and there were actual rifle pits in the rear. By the middle of December, the Confederate, the Confederacy had 37 heavy guns in position along the river. Do they have a weight to heavy, or are they just saying they're big? They're big. So on top... So on September 25th of 1861, the free stone point batteries started getting shelled by the USS Jacob Bell and the USS Simoli. And then on January 1st of 1862, Cockpit Point was shelled by the USS Anacostia and the USS Yankee. Now... Unfortunately, neither side, as we've been learning this entire time, was really doing much to each other. Except, you know, that the Yankee was slightly damaged. So the Union ships, they come back to Cockpit Point again on March 9th. And this time they bring a landing party to from the Anacosta and the Yankee. And they go in to destroy the batteries at Cockpit Point and Evans Point and found them abandoned. I guess the Confederacy was like, um, they keep coming back. Let's just get out of here. Yeah, I mean, at a certain point, it's a sunk cost. Yeah. They also found the CSS page destroyed, blown up, kaboom, kablooey. Eventually, they find that the Confederacy went closer to Richmond. Because they were like, you know what? We sealed off the river for five months. They're really coming at us now. We just... Let's live to fight another day. <laughs> All right. So that is the last battle of the early Eastern Theater. So next time we're going to get into the Carolina coast in 1861 to 1865 and then after that there will be the valley area of operations on the eastern side and i think that'll be good for the next episode well all righty i will say i wasn't expecting uh so many shore battery exchanges what's well, the beginning of the war i thought it was just gonna be more catching of smugglers 
the, the catching the smugglers was a whole blockade. Now we're getting into actual combat between the enemy forces. Well, for the purposes of entertainment, I can't wait until the Confederacy gets a navy. Okay. <laughs> That'll be coming up eventually. <laughs> Soon enough. All right. So uh, this is going to be it. Anything uh, you want to add? Do you want to say, you know, do the EXO stuff at the end? Mm, mm, my gut's telling me I'm supposed to plug something. Um, hmm. Well, if memory serves, we have a Discord server now that we uh, do participate in. So if you guys would like to talk with us or join the community overall, you can find links to that in the show notes. We do have a swag shop. The ship I store. believe those links are in the show note as well. The ship store, yeah. right. That's what we turn the port into. Yeah. And uh, some of you are actually enjoying the uh, shirt designs that we have put out, which that's always nice to see. Where, where can they email you? Well, I'm getting to that one. I'm getting to that oh, okay, one. Okay, okay. Well, lots of pausing. <laughs> Lots of pausing because I'm in the middle of moving down to the brig. Okay, okay, okay. I have okay. to catch my breath. It's several flights of stairs. Yeah, yeah. Stop rushing me. Stop rushing me. <laughs> you guys can tweet at tweet us with at USN History Pod. As you know, long as Ca Twitter still exists at this point in time. And yeah. Yes, uh, uh, assuming Twitter exists still <laughs> by the time this episode releases. <laughs> And I thought I was good at sinking <laughs> ships that I'm supposed to be helping run. Um, failing that, I don't believe Gmail's going anywhere, at least right now. No, I don't and think can... Google <laughs> is dying just yet. But, I mean, it hasn't been bought out by, you know, mad billionaire yet. So what's that email address? You guys can reach out to us with Gmail using US Navy History Podcast at gmail.com. That one's nice and simple. And? And with that, we wish you fair winds and following seas. We do. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time. See you later, folks. U.S. Naval History Podcast. Departing. <laughs>